Hello, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Thank you ever so much for seeing where you are. Um, it was a little bit of a flashback there to uh, to a few months ago, back in January, where we had a few um, audio issues. Not quite sure what happened. As usual, all these sort of glitches, we're never going to know exactly why. Um, I've got some old mic gear now, so um, we're going to carry on as if nothing happened. Hopefully, we can drag a few of the other people back again. So today is all about the skew chisel. Okay, it's designed to be a Q and A. It was spurred on by, by one of you guys, um, and I. Again, I can't remember. I'm really sorry whoever gave me this suggestion. Wanted to look at lace bobbins and then maybe go over the skew chisel as well. So that's what we're going to do. Now, I've done loads of prep for this one, so I hope I can get it in. We may run over four o'clock a little bit, um, but keep those questions coming. Craig's on the questions and the cameras today. So um, give him as many questions as you can. Um, and just to calm him down a little bit, stop us both running around a little bit now if we've got some work to do. So let's have a look. I've got another camera here because one of the questions from a, um, a couple of demos ago was, especially if we're doing the skew chisel, can we get a camera right on the action? So you can see the, um, the bevel rubbing, you can see the angles that we've got on the timber, all those sorts of things. So that one's waiting there. So I'm just going to move them out of the way for the moment so I can play around on the lathe to get these bobbins done. Then we'll turn them on at the last minute. So lace bobbins. Let me show you what a lace bobbin is. So lace bobbins, and I've got two examples here. We've got Midland and we have Honiton. Honiton is a town only probably about eight, nine miles away from where we are at the moment. And that's the um, the bobbin that was famed for Honiton lace. Honiton lace is a very um, fine lace. So the, the actual thread um, would have been round around the neck here. And then the, um, the lace maker would have then for the better word, plaited these over and to make that wonderful lace that you, you associate with Honiton. These are probably more um, a, a common uh, bobbin. This is known as a Midland bobbin. This would have been used with what we call spangles, basically beads, and a brass wire threaded through a little hole in the bottom bead here, and then you would add as many wooden glass um, beads as, as the lace maker uh, wanted to use, depending on the, the gauge of the thread. And again, this would be made, or the lace would be made on a pillow, and loads and loads and loads of these, depending on the size of the lace, would all be plaited over a very, very skilled job. Um, and, uh, and as much skilled job making the lace, in terms of making the actual bobbins, it has become one of those jobs that, um, that is looked at as fairly skilled, only because we're using skew chisel for most of it. So I'm going to make two bobbins. We're just going to really rapidly go through a quick Honiton bobbin, and then we'll do a quick Midland just to show you what it's all about. Um, my first week as an apprentice was making these, and making these with this skew chisel here. So this is the first skew chisel that we're going to look at. Um, this is a very old Robert Sorby skew chisel. Um, I don't know the exact date. You can still see the Robert Sorby. If I can get that close enough to the camera and it stays focused. The little kangaroo that you associate with the Robert Sorby brand there. So you can see how old. This is the original handle, by the way, an ash handle. Um, the original handle tapered, so hand forged skew, so basically beaten with a hammer. Okay, and this is the one that I used as an apprentice. This is the one that we're going to use on this bobbin. You can see that it's still got lots of life in it because I don't do a lot of mechanical sharpening on these. A lot of these are hand honed. So let's just quickly go for a Honiton and then we'll move on and get some big stuff going. So we're just going to scrape the end first. And then with the tip of the skew, just make a little dot. And generally, we used to make these um, in in batches, hundreds at a time, because the ladies would use hundreds at a time. Um, so we would feed them up through the headstock in long lengths. Now I'm gonna go only need four inches or 100 mil. So we're gonna stick to that. Usually my calipers would all be set up with length. Um, we got Craig on questions, like I said, and he's got the first question of the day. Yes, Craig. Hey. Thank you for bearing with us, uh, everybody. Um, yeah, we've got a couple of questions coming, Colwyn. Uh, we've got a guy that's bought a 1628 and a 1218 lathe. Yeah. A bit of um, information on which extractor, what extraction would suit his uh, his lathe. Okay. Well, this is, yes, really, to start with, I want to say that's a really tricky one, tricky one to answer, but I can give you some real um, handy pointers. First of all, go for a, an extractor that creates um, 
airspeed, so volume. So what would traditionally be used for things like plane of thickness is that sort of stuff. So the ones I mean would be um, an impeller type, so ones with bags, or your cyclone type of extractor. They create nice, fast airflow. The reason that that's important to us is because unlike vacuums, something with fast airspeed will pull from a distance. A vacuum is very good to create suction at source, but as soon as you move away from the end of the nozzle, it dissipates, it disappears altogether. So we want something with, with a bit of volume. So the bag type, I'm using um, the AC118CE, but uh, you know you can go to the 60CE if you wanted to. Um, but any of that range, so steer away from vacuum extractors, any of the others. The bigger the extractor, the more airflow and the more holding capacity you're going to get. Okay. Yes, Craig. Yeah, another question. What's the bevel angle on your signature skew? The bevel angle on the bevel angle I advise on the signature skew is a combined angle of 50 degrees, so 25 degrees each side. So if we use my hands as the skew, the angle in the middle, 50 degrees. 50, uh, 25 degrees each side of that bevel. You may not get that from the factory, okay? The, the, a lot of these are hand um, uh, linished before they come out, so they may not be precise. Don't worry about that, though. Stick with what you've got for the minute. You'll get used to it. Um, the only time I would say change that, if it's extremely acute, so acute I mean coming too far back like that, because the further back you come, the more aggressive they get. Now, just while we're talking that, I had a fantastic email um, from Jim Stevens. Now, Jim Stevens has, has uh, posed a really uh, interesting question. He's asked which would be best or less aggressive, um, a concave, a convex, or a straight bevel. Now, I can answer that fairly quickly. A le the least aggressive there would be a convex curve, and that's something I used to use, again, as an apprentice. If you're really struggling with this with, with a skew chisel, use a convex curve. Then it goes to straight, so something like a linisher, Jason's very kindly sharpened me uh, a straight bevel on one of the skews we're going to use today. That's um, That's been done on an initia. Or a concave you would get from using a, a sharpening stone, Tormek, um, bench grinders, those sorts of things. You can make them calmer by putting a secondary bevel on the end, sharpening with a diamond hone, that sort of thing. Um, there's several things in this email that, um, that we're going to talk about today, but he's also included, Jim has also included a couple of really, really useful links. And they're links to... Um, Jim Scarcella's website, but also a really interesting article that Jim Scarcella has done on the skew chisel and the different types and the bevels as well. So have a look for those links. Um, we will post them because we've had to redo the link for the, the um, uh, this stream. So we'll repost them later on for you. But if you look at Jim Scarcella, um, and uh, there's a, like I say, it's a really, really useful article. Yes, Craig. Yeah, another couple of questions. Just let me scroll back through. Uh, Vicky's asked, um, when would you use one of the three-point chisels? <laughs> if you're asking me, I wouldn't, but um, they, they might be someone's most loved favorite tool in the world. Um, three-point chisels can be used for uh, uh, several things. They can be used for V-cutting. They can be used for rolling beads, even though I haven't found a way of doing it. Um, and they can be used for cleaning up uh, end grain as well. I have never used one um so probably not the best person to advise on them but those are the the, the sort of key areas that it says that they're good for yes. and a question from maria um she's bought a half inch round scraper what angle has been ground uh, as a factory and ground angle uh, it seems to be a, a steeper angle than our existing scrapers yeah i mean they don't come with a massive angle on them it probably about 80 degrees i would have thought um but, you know, scrapers will work anything from 90 to, well, to a skew chisel, to be fair. The, the minute you break from 90 and you start grinding back this way, they get more and more aggressive until you get to about 45 degrees. When you start coming back past 45 degrees, they start calming down again. If you then put a, um, a, a grind on the top edge, you're then going into negative rate, and that's where um, we're getting those really um, calm scrapes. So we would use negative rates, for instance, on acrylics, polyesters, all those sorts of things, skew chisels and negative rakes. All right. So, yeah, that's, the, you know, they, they all different between manufacturers. So but I would say about 80 degrees. Yes, great. And Woodwork Learners asks, what's the difference between a standard skew and yours? 
Standard SKU, um, the, right, there's many differences between all of the SKUs that I'm going to use today. Standard SKU, I would always refer to a standard SKU. Um, and if we go above, I think, Craig, it might be the best angle here. There's a standard SKU. So basically flat, okay, on both um, sides and edges. Um, so no rolled edge or anything like that. Um, generally, a, a skew angle will be about 70 degrees on this edge here, um, but that will change massively depending on the, the guy using the girl or guy using the skew. Um, so flat, um, made now from just flat steel and either laser cut, water cut, um, and, um, and then an edge put on. The, the Cohen Way signature skew, so here's a signature skew. These are based, so there's this one here is my skew. So you can see it's got a taper on it. It also gets thinner the closer to the tip you get. So the balance is um, far better than a big lump of metal like that. Traditionally, if I go back to an original German skew, which is where they were born really, there's a hand forged. You can see the fettle marks in there still. These would have been beaten with a handle, uh, with a hammer. So what we've got is a piece of steel that wide was beaten out to be that wide. So you get good balance. And again, like I said earlier, it gets thinner. You can see toward the edge as opposed to that fat edge. Now, my old hand forged British um, skew here, the old Robert Sorby one, the same thing was done with that, the same process. You can see it getting thinner toward the end. But then they were trimmed square. So that's the only difference. We, we used to make them all in the same way, but this one used to be trimmed square. Now, modern... Um, standard skews, like I say, they're just the same thickness all the way up through the steel. So it, it creates quite a heavy uh, skew chisel. The reason mine are shaped the way they are, like the German skews, they're lighter. They give the user more, um, uh, they persuade the user to hold the chisel lightly. So then you get feeling back in your hands. You can feel the be bevel rub in the timber. And um, the skew chisel is all about bevel rubbing timber. So that's the difference, the main difference. Yes, Craig. Uh, and James, uh, he says he had a go at your coloured bowl after the last session, which is lovely, great. Um, had a trouble with bleeding on the edges? Uh, any tips? Okay, yeah. So if you're getting lots of bleeding on the edges, now that can be for several reasons. Firstly, um, the timber might be a particularly soft one, so a, a more sponge-like, very, very dry, for instance. And like on um, Tuesday last week, or no, uh, Thursday last week, where we were applying it with a, a brush, we were lathering loads of the stuff into the the. the the timber so if you want to do that same sort of bowl the best thing to do will give it a coat of sanding sealer but then sand the outer surface off properly before you apply your first coat of sealer because what you want to do is the sanding sealer to penetrate like the dye has but then you still need a good surface on the outside to have the dye to adhere to so make sure once you put your sanding sealer on you then sand it back heavy before you put your first coat on that would be a good a good way. If you're if you're doing a hollow form, for instance, and you're not worried about bleed, then you can lather it on with a brush. Um, alternatively, put it on with a rag, so you put actually, you know less sealer, uh, less color in as well. So those those two things. Try those and see how you get on. All right, right. We're going to whiz through some turning. Let's just quickly make uh, a Honiton bobbin quite speedily. So we're going to go with a fast laser speed. There we are. And we're going to go with, let me just, I'm going to use my original skew, the one that I, I started off with. So we're going to rough down with the skew first. I always used to just use two tools when I was doing lace bobbins, this one and a little one eighth round nose scraper. Didn't really need anything else. A little bit faster. So all we're doing, this is a square bit of timber, a, a tiny little bit of timber. So it's quite easy to rough down with this skew forwards and back. We'll show you this technique as well on the, the larger pieces in a moment. I'm just getting it down to size. It's a little bit big, this blank, when we used it. So it's getting it down to size. Same on this end. That'll do us. Now we're just going to do the little neck where the the thread is wound, ready to make the lace. We always leave this till the end because this is going to be the thinnest area. 
So little V cuts. There's no double bevel on this skew. This is a single bevel, flat ground skew. And I can do this quite easily either on a diamond stone, on a, a bench grinder. Because it's such a small bevel, it's going to give me fairly flat surface. Now, the technique that I'm using here is using the heel to creep up to any detail. So you can just see that heel getting right into those corners. And I'm just going to part this one off and we'll ask, answer another question from Craig. So before I do this, what we would normally do again is give it a sand and a coat of some um, friction polish. And then that is your first bobbin done. So I'm just going to part this off. Browning over and then it'll pop. Okay, so that's our first bobbin. Yes, Craig, more questions. Question from Maria in Wales. Do uh, lace bobbins have to be a particular length and width thickness? Um, there's there's certain perimeters that uh, the, the lace um, maker will, will prefer, um, and you'll find every turner has their own style, as in um, design, especially of Midland bobbins. Um, and some lace makers prefer some makers over the others. Um, generally, we're working towards around about uh, four and a half inches. So what's that around about 100 and, 115 mils, something like that, um, in length. Um, and then you've just got to think about the people making the lace. So they've got to handle these and they've got to plait them over each other hundreds and hundreds of thousands of times. So nothing too intricate, nothing that's going to be painful. So what I tend to do, or certainly our design, which was which is quite a popular one, um, the main area, the main part of the body is actually quite smooth. The decoration is down where the spangles are going to be hung from and also where the, the, um, uh, the thread is going to be wound. But this area, which is handled, is a smooth area. So it's worth thinking about that. Worth thinking about the end user as well. Slightly thick. Yes, Craig. I'm going to put, but while Craig's asking the question, I'm just going to load the lathe up with the next piece. Slightly thicker bit of timber. Generally quarter inch, six mil. This is a bit bigger. Uh, can you show the, the tip of that single bevel skew that you had a moment ago? A nice close up for the folks. Which one was that? With the one I'm using? Single bevel, yeah. That's the that one there. That's it, I think, yeah. Yeah. Nice so, close up. There we are. Looks good. So just a single bevel. There are no, no secondary bevels on that one. All right. Yes. Go for it. And we've question. got another question from Cliff. Um, what height should the tool rest be, uh, say, for a three-inch diameter cylinder? Uh, he has an AC305 and a robust tool rest. So tool, uh, tool rest height, got any advice on that? For general turning, um, I would go anything from quarter inch below, so six mil below for general turning. Then when you start using the skew chisel, I like to be about, on that size of material, probably about four or five mil above, so a tool, tool width above, um, but that's about it. I mean, some people prefer to be a little bit lower with a bowl gouge if they're doing big bowls, um, but but that within that range tends to work uh, for me. Little nib in the end. Don't worry, we are going to go to some of the bigger pieces in a minute, guys. Um, let's just get uh, one of these nice decorative Midland bobbins out before we carry on. There we are. These are a little bit more intricate, only because there's lots of beads and things like that, so... Great skew chisel practice. I was thrown into this as an apprentice as not really doing much uh, apart from a work experience placement. So this was great practice because they were small things that we were turning. Um, you never got intimidated by the skew because a little catch with a skew on a piece this big is exactly that. It's a little catch. So you never got intimidated. So I spent a few weeks just turning lace bobbins practicing how to roll beads without that added worry or or fear so just down to around we'll lay it out again normally i would have if i was doing batch batches of these um 
dividers set up giving me lengths. We're not. We're only doing one, so we don't need to. So there we are. Let's go. That's the neck. Then we're going to go one, two, three. So these are our beads. So mini V cuts. There we are. Up here, we would. This is where I would have used that little round nose scraper. It was the little little um. Little concave we have there, little cove. We'll just do another little bead for this one. Let's roll our beads over. Now we know that we're getting a good bevel rub because we've got a lovely burnish there. Look, then down this end, this we need to create the little bead where the spangles would live. So a slightly bigger V cut. I'm not going to do that bead until the last thing. That's the last thing we do because otherwise the stress of turning this piece will take him away from the chuck. So let's do that nice OG. A little bit of flex from the timber, but most of the time that's nothing to worry about. The only time that would be an issue is if there was a flaw in the timber or if the grain was cross grain. And this is running down the grain nicely. It's a piece of brown oak, by the way. What would be the preferred timber to use for lace bobbins, Colin? No, they were varied. A lot of people would collect lace bobbins um, and they'd like to have different timbers in their collection. So it was a real magical collection of, of timbers. Back then, and we're talking 35 years ago, we had a, a completely different spectrum of timbers available to us than we do now. Um, we had things like, everybody's heard of Purple Heart, um, but we used to have the Colombian Purple Hearts, which were very dense, almost like boxwood, with pale, creamy saps, a lot of partridge wood, Ziracotes, um, Coca Bolos, um, uh, Macassar Ebony's, really amazing timbers. Not saying we don't have them now. We have some lovely timbers now, but this, uh, the landscape has changed a little. There we are. So that's uh, a Midland lace bob. And let me just quickly put some abrasive on there. I just want to show you next stage, really, before we move on to something nice and big. As much as showing you how to use a skew i want to show you how not to use it as well i want to create some catches because they're always quite spectacular everybody likes to see the catch and understand why they happen understanding why why things go wrong will really benefit you in putting them right there we go let's just just i'm just tickling this over with this is actually 150 grit so i would go all the way down to 400 grit and then use a little bit of friction polish So let's just say we've gone to 400 grit. A little bit of friction polish. I've just put the tool rest back and I shouldn't. And there's a reason we use tissue and we don't use rag. Right? So my fingers don't get taken with it. That was a good example, actually, of what happens. And the reason I don't use rag on in big section, same reason I don't use um, wire woolen on the lathe at all, because the same thing happens. Here we are. We're going to pass off. So hand over the other side using the tip of the skew. And then push forward with a straight cut. Everything stops. That one can come away. You then line up, flatten off for the next one, make a little dot. And away you go. On to number two. By the time you've done two or three weeks of making lace bobbins like that, you're going to be really quite good at the skew chisel. Yes, Craig. 
couple of questions here, Colwyn. And um, what jaws are those you're using there? So we are using the pin jaws. These are originally made for, they're called pin jaws because they're, they're um, taking on the role of a pin chuck. So a pin chuck used to be, you don't see them very often now, but pin chucks are really made for um, natural edge turning where you drill a hole down through your natural edge, your, your bowl blank, um, and then you you put the uh, you put the pin chuck in, and the pin chuck had a flat on one side with a little um, a little pin, and as you put that pin chuck in, rotate the chuck around, um, that pin would lock up from that flat. You see, this now means that we can do the same thing: drill the hole down through the the bowl blank, and then expand into that recess, so you're not damaging the natural edge, um, and then turn the outside of the bowl, create a hold point hold that whole point to turn the inside out. So that's what they call pin jaws. Yes, great. Uh, question from Maria. Did you cut the beads and the coves with the point? Uh, beads and the coves, yeah, um, yes. So everything was done then with the, that skew, that single process, or with or that whole bobbin just with that skew chisel. Um, you know, coves like this are so small um or so so gradual that the skew does that quite easily everything was done um uh, with that same skew like i say the only thing i i used to have a little cove here instead of that v cut and so for that i used to have a little one eighth round nose scraper to do that job only everything else was skew chisel all right right big stuff let's get some big stuff on the lathe. let's make some horrible crashes and bangs with the skew chisel and i want to talk more about different skews and grinds and things like that now i do want to make one thing clear here and you've no doubt heard me talk about my skew chisel forever um i am not saying that that's the best skew out there at all the reason that skew is there is I've I've seen the need for it. Um, I love the way the German skew chisels handle. We didn't have them in this country before I approached um, Crown to, to get them back in the country. Um, the, the reason I think they're really useful, especially for someone that's struggling with a skew, is they encourage you, like I've already said, to hold the skew chisel gently so you can feel the relationship between the bevel and the timber. So that's the reason that I like them. Now, there are loads of skews out there. Lots of people, production turners especially, like using flat skews or round skews. Just look at people like um, Steve the Wood Turner, Dave Dolby, Les Thorne, um, uh, Richard Finley. All those guys, they'll all be using those flat um, uh, skews. They will also use the regular skews, but they, you know, they, they'll master those flat skews. Um, for, for beginners... Big bevels is where we, we what we need. We need something with not an acute angle. We want something like this. So where we're talking convex um, grinds, flat grinds, secondary bevels on the edge, those sorts of things. Okay, and that's why we put a twenty five degree um, angle on on my skew. So we're going to look at loads in a minute. Yes, Craig. Uh, Fredericks asks, do you always turn lace bobbins between centres or can you use your hand to support the work? Um, he asks, as there is a central hole in the end, isn't there? Um, and he hopes that makes sense. Um, always between centres. Always between centres. We used to do a thing called a cow and calf or mother and child um, bobbin, which was basically a hollow bobbin with another little mini bobbin inside that was fretted so you can see through it. And that generally used to be um two precious timbers um and then there would be a, a moment where we'd have to support the bobbin in with one hand yes but no generally you know support from both ends is always going to be a bit better yes great yes a question from roy here um how do you know when it's time to change the sanding grits are you going kind of mostly by feel yeah feel smell temperature um, a lot of experience as well, um, feeling the grit. You'll know, you'll see, you can see the dust as well. So if a, a bit of abrasive starts to dull, it'll get hotter, um, it'll glaze. So you'll, the, the actual finish it's producing is glazed, but scratchy. Um, so that's always a good, a good sign. Um, the dust starts to, to disappear, especially on sanding pads, on the your power sanding pad, you'll see very little dust. Things start to, to smoke. Um, the smell changes, you get a very warm smell sort of thing. So all of the above, really. Um, yeah, and again, a little bit of experience thrown in as well, which you won't have 
unless you practice. Yes, Greg. Yeah, and can we go back to the um, single bevel skew? I think a lot of people are kind of picturing one facet, one angle, kind of like a regular chisel. Yep. Can you just explain what you mean by this single bevel? Yeah, well, we'll get two up, actually. This is the one, the larger one here is the one that Jason's done for me earlier. Let's get that shine out. Right, there we are. So ba basically what we're talking about with a single bevel, but so single bevel on both sides. So rather than a double bevel, a double bevel is used, and I would always, we've got a hollow grind on your skew chisel, put a secondary bevel on the very edge of the skew, and that will act like a, that will act like a convex bevel. It will calm the chisel down, make it nice and sweet, um, not aggressive. Think about what a, um, a concave or hollow ground bevel is doing. Basically, it's rubbing only on its very heel and the very cutting edge. And that creates very aggressive cutting action. So what we need to do is soften that either by flattening, by convexing, or double beveling the bevel. Okay. But there, as the single bevel is literally that just one flat surface. Yes, great. Uh, Maria's asked, what's the best or easiest way to drill a hole in the end of a bobbin? Um, so, uh, Chuck, so literally, um, have the bobbin held in there so as before it's actually turned fully um, use a drill chuck in your tail stock and the main bit of timber in your um, in the chuck of your, your headstock and then you can drill through all day long or we start with a small hole and increase it like um, like engineers do with reaming um, drills same sort of thing going with small to start with keep them on track and then increase it slowly and get a cleaner finish that way Yes, great. And a question from Mike. Um, he's recently bought a set of button jaws, which are great, he says. Uh, but what are the long slots for in each plate? Uh, da, 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 button jaws. Um, so okay, so you you can um, the the stackers and things like that. You could use those um, randomly. You can screw through with normal wood screws, all those sorts of things. Um, it just um, it's just a way of repositioning things. There's, they're not threaded. You can't add a, a bolt to them and that sort of thing, but you could if you wanted to use a screw and, and things like that. Through. Um, that's it. That's it. Right. right, I'm just going to quickly rough this down with a roughing gouge I, I, rather than a skew. Just don't want to frighten your, you too quickly. So lay speed up a little. And I'll tell you what, keep, if you pop the camera on that one, Craig. I'm just going to pop the GoPro on, see if we can get that one up and running, just so we can show you a little bit closer. Two seconds. I'm still here, everybody. Don't worry. There's no glitches. I'm just getting this camera up and running for us, and we can get right in on the action if we do that. Okay. Really quite close. Might get in the way. We might move it a couple of times, but there we are. So we're going to rough down first. This is running. I want to be running around about 1,600 revs. This is a great way to practice the skew chisel. Or just, but what we're going to do is just do a load of repetitive cuts. So uh, something that I do with all beginner students. So look where we are at the moment. So that is just below center. So that's my roughing cut. Okay. Let me just show you what happens when we don't get it quite right. So let's take one of the the regular skews, single ground skew. I'm not raising the tool rest. But look where we are at the moment. Look how low that skew chisel is. We've got our center point running just at the top of the, the tool rest. But the trouble is, when we've got the tool rest that low and we're trying to create a skew cut, your tip here is really, really close to all the action to where the, the, um, the, the timber is. And it only takes a little drop of that tip to contact the timber and bang. But that's all happening at quite a fast rate of, of, of speed. So... We're going to create one of those catches actually in a minute. What I need to do is bring the tool rest up 
So then that tip is above the timber, out the way, so it can't catch. Let me create a catch for you. See if you recognize the sound. So I'm going to get too close with that tip and bang. I'll do it again. Okay, now we'll stop the lay. We'll have a look. I'm holding the chisel quite lightly in my hand so it can fly back. If you're nervous of the skew, you tend to hold on really tightly. And then that just drives that catch in really, really far. And also pushes you around a little bit. It frustrates you, makes you angry. And then it's just like a, you know, um, a perpetual problem. You get angry, you get more frustrated. So you get tenser, you're holding the chisel harder. So the catches get deeper and so on. What we need to do is have the torus high. Rub the bevel initially, then lift. Let me get, I'm going to get even closer. We might as well. Let's get right in to see that chisel work. Rub the bevel, lift the handle. Now look at the part that's doing the touching. Can you see it's the bottom half of the skew? A lot of people say bottom third, but as long as you're below the halfway point, you're fine. Now, let me do one clean cut first. Pass the camera. So we'll do that again. And what we're getting off there is planar shavings. Now, all apart from those big digs that we had earlier, the finish compared to a roughing finish, is far superior. It's a really, really nice finish that we're getting on there. But you saw what I was doing there. That was a 45-degree presentation here. So that angle, this one, 45 degrees it, to the top line of our work. And as I lift the handle, that cutting edge is touching, giving me that nice planar shaving. Yes, great. Yeah, we've got a question. Um, a lot of people really liking the new camera angle, Colwyn. Oh, so good. That, that down the line view. Um, would it be better, a question from Frederick, uh, would it be better or safer to use a larger skew on larger work? Uh, absolutely would be. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So let's have a look at my German skew. There we are. Much bigger surface there. It is very slightly hollow ground, so you will see right on the very tip there that shows it the secondary bevel that i was talking to you about okay and that calms that chisel down and makes it nice and easy to use with that little tiny secondary bevel so yeah bigger stuff so if you're up to sort of four or five inch mule posts and you're trying to do a cut with a small chisel you're going to really struggle because that chisel tip is so close to the action One other thing I'd like you to pick up on here is where my hands are. So they're touching the actual steel of the tool. I'm not actually in touch on the handle any way at all. It's all on the steel. Okay. Craig, just go to camera one just for a minute. So that's my German skew. Look at the size of the handle. The handle is a hand width only. Okay, the, the seldom amount of time you're gonna be holding the handle, you do it with one hand. Most of the time we're holding the steel because we can feel the rubbing of the bevel through the steel. Handles are designed to take away vibration, to, to numb your, your sense from what's happening. We don't want that, we wanna feel it in this instance. It's different with a bowl gouge and things like that. On a skew, we need to feel it. So um, traditional German um, skew chisels are always made with the handle one hand width, okay, instead of long handles like we're used to. Again, on our standard skew, compared to that blade, that handle is probably a little bit longer. Okay, there we are. Yes, Craig. Yeah, we've got another couple of questions come in. So a uh, question from Donna, and how small will the pen jaws grip? Um, down to zero. I'll better check that before I say too much. <laughs> Let's just have a look. There we go. Maybe you can get that, Craig, on the overhead. There we are. So we're down to zero. So if you want to hold millimeter drill bits and things like that, absolutely no problem. Yes, Craig. Um, Martin's recently purchased the pen jaws, but having a little trouble keeping the drill bit 
in line when drilling? Any tips? Yeah, undo the bolts. Just just slacken the bolts off a little bit that hold it onto. So those here, the, the ones that hold it actually onto the chuck. Just slack them off a little bit. Retighten the chuck, retighten the bolts, and you'll find that center them all up. That's great. And Roger's asked, do you ever use, uh, use polyurethane finish? Uh, no. No, I'm just trying to think of what instance you might mean. But if we're talking um, turning in general, I don't really. Polyurethane, um, no. Uh, not as a not as a lathe finish. Um, sort of some of the, the wood varnishes nowadays are polyurethane. Some of those, yes. Um, but that would be on flat work as opposed to maturing. But um, no, I don't, not on turning. Okay, so let's just go back to our skews. There's, there's a few skews we've showed you already. I just want to, we've spoken about the bevel um, the bevel angle um, and presentation angle of the bevel, those sorts of things. But what I've got here, we've also, we haven't spoken about, apart from the flat skews, um, is the curved version. So again, this is this is a curved bevel here. So you can see the front face there. Okay, we've got that, that curved curved blade these are really really nice to use as well you may find again if you're struggling with a, um, a regular grind you may find these a little bit easier to roll beads with certainly nice to plane with but again you'll see quite a lot of professional turners using curved skews I don't know why a lot of French turners tend to use um, curved skews as well. I must be a part of a part of France that um, has championed that sort of style. But there, nice little curve on the face of the skew. One thing that I wanted to show you is this: it doesn't really matter that that planing cut before we move on to, to beading. That planing cut that we were using there, it doesn't really matter what your skew looks like. But the key is always that you start with your bevel rubbing. If you go into it with a cut initially, that's the recipe for a catch. So start with the bevel rubbing, lift the handle till you see dust, then move. Keep the bevel rubbing all of the time. If you're trying to do a planing cut, you've got no bevel rubbing. You're going to have lots and lots of turning lines there and an unclean finish. Now, when I said it doesn't really matter what size your skew is or what it looks like, we're just going to do, just for a bit of fun, I'm just going to show you something different. This is a big bowl gouge, a half-inch bowl gouge. But you present it in the same way, you're going to get a planing cut the same as you would a skew chisel. We're doing exactly the same thing. The action is still the same. If you want to be really experimental, this is still a planing cut. We're doing nothing different. The bevel's rubbing nicely. Just to demonstrate, it doesn't really matter the size of your skew, the tool you're using. As long as you can get the bevel rubbing, you can get roughly 45 degrees presentation on the timber. You're going to get a lovely clean finish. I'm not suggesting you start using the axis of skew. It wouldn't be the safest way to go about things. And the handle gets in the way as well. But it's, it's just demonstrate the, the, the point that bevel rubbing skew angle is, is uh, the key. Yes, Craig. Uh, question about kind of tool presentation from Frederick. Um, as you present the tool, do you rub the bevel up high and then slowly drop the edge into the work? So, yeah, good question, that one. So what we're doing is it's almost like a... a a, a, a slide so i'm going to rub the bevel and then rather than just lift my handle because if i just lift the handle i'm rubbing on the timber i'm going to lever away from the tool rest so as i lift i've got to slide it down the tool rest so it's coming down to the timber there's my cut do that again there and it's sliding down the tool rest until i get the cut going and then we sort of freeze as we move along the timber you hold the handle and steel at the same height as you progress along um, the, the, the length of the timber there. Yes, great. 
Uh, Jim B was recently parting off uh, fairly hard, and he got his tool blue. Has right. he damaged it? Do you think? No, no, um, no. You haven't. So what? So blueing the steel. So you're basically hardening that steel. Your your tempering. Well, tempering would be quenching as, as well. You you. We've all seen at school. If we've been through metalwork class, you have the color. Um, chart on the wall telling you how hot to get the steel before you quench it. Basically, turning it blue is turning it so hard that it's become quite brittle. It doesn't go all the way down the steel. Ignore the, don't try and make it happen, but ignore the fact it has now happened. Sharpen it in the same way you no, you normally would. You may find it a little bit harder to sharpen. That's the only thing. Um, but sharpen it in the, the way you normally would and just carry on using it. OK, you'll probably find it's a slightly sharper edge, which won't last as long. That's all. So, you know, you slowly get rid of that that extra hardness and you'll be back into normal steel again. The only thing I would say, you know, we pay a lot of money for for um, tools to be treated and called high speed steel because they've been heat treated to get to a certain um, degree of hardness. We ruin it by uh, ruin that hardness by um, by bluing it. So try not to. But don't worry about it. You, you haven't wasted your money. Just keep using it. Yes, great. And just to confirm, I know you've mentioned this a number of times through your videos. Um, the roughing gauge is a spindle roughing gauge yeah. for center work, not bowl work. Absolutely. Just... Yeah, spindle roughing gouge. It's full name, spindle roughing gouge, designed for what we're doing here. That ever use it on a bowl, you will have an accident the first time you use it on a bowl. Okay, and they can be quite severe accidents as well. Yes, great. And what's your opinions on kind of traditional scrapers versus kind of carbide tools? Uh, traditional. I'm very much in the traditional um, camp. I prefer the um, the traditional tools over carbide. However, what I, well, not I found, but what we found generally as an industry, carbide tools have brought lots of people into wood turning that would never have done it because they would have had one go fed up with how difficult the tools are to learn and never picked it up again if you you got to think you know if someone's picking uh, starting a hobby and they can only manage to throw a few hours at it every couple of weeks learning all of these tools that we're playing with you know that takes a long time so to have the ability to make something nice quickly from you know very little practice is is a real asset now they have to be careful we all have to be careful with what we do but it's given that the user that ability to be able to make something fairly fairly quickly you know roughing down roughing down with a carbide i would have never dreamt to do that but it, it can be done all right yes great yeah question from peter are you like uh are you less likely to get a catch if you present the tool above 45 with potentially a, a trade-off against a quality of cut um, so, okay, let's have a look at that. So um, you're not less likely to get a catch, but it's used. We use that for several um, several things. If, let's get the, uh, the angle here. So there's my 45. If I change from that 45, there we are. If I change from that 45 and bring the tool handle round, so now I'm almost in line, the cutting edge is in line. What that's going to do is scrape and be quite aggressive. I don't want to do that, certainly when I'm trying to plane. But let's say, for instance, I'm trying to trying to create a cut in a concave. So this isn't flat at the moment, but I want to get into a concave. If I bring that handle up and present more of an upright cut, it's going to give me a nicer finish, but I'm not able to sort of iron out lumps and bumps. So it'd be quite ridged finish. The 45 gives me the ability to iron or hand plane out lumps and bumps, go over the, the peaks um, and go and, and go through troughs. So it cleans that finish up. That's why 45 is used generally. It's a good all-rounder. If you're following a code, just stand them up a little bit more upright. All right. Okay, another question or we'll... Yeah, we've got a, a, probably another couple of questions. Uh, Mark has said that he sees that we stock Tormec. Can we stock the Tormec DF250 diamond stones? Uh, is there a plan to do a 200 millimeter diameter version for, for the smaller Tormec? I don't know, Craig. You know, I think I saw an email flash past my eyes a little while ago, and I think it's going to be launched soon. And I do believe we may have a video featuring that very particular stone. Um, I think end of September, beginning of October. So so stay tuned. That will be featured. Mark. There you go. 
hot off the press. Hot off, literally. Off, I think I read the email this morning, guys. So uh, good timing, <laughs> Mark. Well done. Um, another question from, uh, well, a little comment from Maria. So uh, one of the best sessions we've done, Team Axminster. So thank you. Despite the false start. Despite the false start. Well, thank yeah. you ever so much, Maria. Thank you very much. But we're not going to get a huge amount more done. But what I'd like to do is just roll some beads. Again, it's another big problem that people have. Um, and again, we're going to create some catches. I want to show you why we get catches um, when rolling beads. I'm going to go to my favorite skew. My favorite skew is the big signature skew, 32 mil. And we're going to start off. So let's say you've just turned up on a course um, and you've never touched a lady in your life. First thing I'm going to get you to do, and I'm going to go through the practice piece. So we'll do half of this piece of timber. You've roughed it down, so now you feel like a real turner because you've got some shavings flying all over the place. Now we're going to divide this up with a pencil. 25 mil. 25 to 30 mil, so inch to inch and a quarter. That'll be enough to start us off. That area there, I tend to use as uh, a little bit of gouge, spindle gouge work, that sort of thing. So we've got our line. We're now going to use the very tip very tip of the tool, the toe actually. Um, yeah, go go um, GoPro a second. So there we are, toe, heel. So long points to toe, short points to heel. We're gonna use the toe first, replace the lines that we've drawn on with a cut. And just one, just pushing forward. Once you've done that, we're gonna come either side of the line, very slightly tilt the, the chisel. And this is a V cut both sides and keep going until your v-cut is the depth that you want that v to be and here's a tip if you're practicing your bead forming and are uncertain about uh, the skew then go nice and shallow don't go too deep with your beads Now, you can see here where the, the tool is. So we're actually in line with the cut that I'm creating. I'm not flinging the handle out anywhere. Here we are. So we've got our series of beads. I'm just going to bring that GoPro around a little bit just to get you right in there. You can see the messy bits of the workshop now. Okay, so I wanna roll these beads over. So we're gonna stick with the same tool, 45 degrees. now. Again, what I'll tend to get people to do now is put a center line where their bead is. And just to demonstrate what we're about to do, we're going to start making cuts. First cut being here, right on the corner and down to the V. Second cut there, down to the V. Third cut, so on. And I want to, by the, end, the time I finished, is leave this center line alone. I don't want it to have been taken away at all. We're going to rub the bevel and then lift the heel into play. Rub the bevel, lift the heel into play. Right down to the bottom of your V. Do that again. And we're looking for that little bird line. So that little fluffy line. Follow that fluffy line all the way down to the bottom of the V. We'll do the same on the other side. Now again, you can see where my handle is. The handle or the line is directly in line with the cut that I'm producing. Okay, the reason we do that, and I'm gonna demonstrate another catch in a minute, it's because if I start bringing the handle out and rolling over, again, I'm bringing the bevel away from the timber. I need to have the bevel rubbing. So that a lot of that noise you're hearing is bevel rub. So by bringing the handle away, you're going to remove the bevel and you're going to get a catch. And you'll know a catch 
from rolling a bead. Let's uh, well, let's make one happen. Uh, but catch from rolling the bead is basically um, a spiral up the, the the bead. So let's go with a catch and then come over. I'm going to push the handle away. And the minute I push the handle out, you get that little spiral catch that travels up up the bead. Okay. So avoid that. Go back to your point, your heel point. Keep your handle in line and roll over. Okay. Do a couple more. And as you progress, you might find that the heel's not working for you. You might want to go to just the cutting edge. Again, people like Dave, Dave Dolby, Steve the Woodturn on Instagram. Watch those guys. They are very, very good at, at um, uh, B forming, skew um, work. It's their live deal. That's what they do. Yes, Craig. So, uh, yeah, Frederick has said, um, can we see you use two skews at the same time? He's said that you do this at the start of your lessons. Two skews at the same oh, no, I've never done that. Marie is quite keen to see it, too. and so am I, actually. Um, yeah, you've got two hands, haven't you? <laughs> um, I wouldn't do that at the start of a lesson because that would be called showing off, um, and I wouldn't want to make it look – I wouldn't want it to be dangerous Un Unlike somebody. using an axe, that's, that's not showing and off. That not showing off not at all. At all. Okay. That's just demonstrating a, a, a thing. Okay. Um, no, I can't use two skews at the same time. Um, no. No. <laughs> dangerous, don't do it. <laughs> Anything else? Um, <laughs> at this point, not at the this moment. Point, no. uh, you can continue. <laughs> let's just let's just do a big table leg. Did I do this? Oh, I've done something similar for you on the cabriole leg, didn't I? So let's just do a quick one. I'm going to move that that GoPro back. We'll get a bigger view with the GoPro if we want to use it in a minute. Um, I'll keep I'll keep it there, but. Put a big bit of timber on and just turn something, shall we? I'm going to leave the axe alone. This is something we've all done before, but there's, well, I said we've all done before. I've done many times and demonstrations because it, it's, uh, it has a lot of technique in, but also it's being able to turn with a square section as well. Pummels, we know what pummels are. Pummels are the square section to round. Yes, Craig. Yeah, Maria's uh, asked, I haven't done some of the smaller beads on the lace bobbins with the point. Is it best to do the large beads with the heel? Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. The, the minute you go big, go heel. Definitely. Definitely. Did I turn them with the point? I thought I turned them with the heel. I wasn't watching. If I, if I was going to think about it, I think I would turn it with the heel. I'm sure the bobbin was turned with the heel then. I might have been flustered from our dodgy start. Is there any benefit, Nigel's asked, is there any benefit on running the lathe fairly slowly when practicing the skew? No, no. The trouble, if you do that, Nigel, what will happen, you get a lot of bounce, um, and that really is a problem. Um, so, no, slow is not, you know, is not, not any help at all. It would be far more of a hindrance. I mean, for instance, trying to trying to do a V-cut on something like this, it's just bounce and pushes me around. I need to be whizzing over the, the chisel tip, whizzing. Um, on this sort of size, I'm going to be up to about 1,400 revs. There we are. And I'm going to start upright with the skew. I've already made a line, so I can well, you can just see in the camera, actually, the line. So I've started upright. Now I'm going to angle the skew. And all this is half a V cut. I'll just show you where we are. So we've got our line, okay, the top of the pummel, and we've got a nice, now clean um, edge of the pummel. This is going to be roughed out. Yes, great. Uh, your skew chisels, can you just confirm what angle they were ground out again, please? So the, the I recommend 25 degrees per side, so 50 degrees combined angle. Like I said, you may not get that out of the factory because they are hand-linished. 
before they leave. Um, so stick with what you get from the factory. But if you're going to regrind them, go to um, 25 degrees per side. Yes, Craig. Uh, a couple of people mentioning that it would be really nice to have a workshop tour. So potentially people come in here to have a little look around. <laughs> I love that idea, don't we? I mean, maybe going forward if there's potential, but but yeah. who knows? Well, yeah. You know, when when things kind of get back to normal, which they are getting more back to normal, we own all, we know uh, we all know that. So uh, you know, we like to see people and meet people. We at this time of the year we'd have normally been out to shows and maybe met some of you guys at. And the, show, the woodworking shows that are up and down the country, but uh, yeah, so maybe in the future, in the definitely, future. yeah, good idea, bright future, yeah. There we are. Let's rough that out. Yeah, workshop tour would be great. The only trouble is, there's only this side that's tidy, so you'll see all of our mess. Where am I going to put all my stuff? Okay, let's just rough that out. So I'm below center now. Roughing gouge, spindle roughing gouge. Everything's nice and tight. Turning there at fourteen hundred revs. Turn the roughing gouge over, have the flute facing around about nine o'clock, and then I can get right the way up to the pummel without hitting it. There we are. Okay, let's raise the tool rest. We're going to askew. Lovely. Going to clean that finish up. So let's go with the big skew. My Big bruiser. This one here. Just clean the finish. Back the other way. When I get close to that detail again we're going to rely on the heel because i want to get right up to the pummel so i go up to the heel and ride to that edge okay we're going to do a slightly deeper v cut there and then i'm going to round over what i want to do is a half v One more then. Clean up the bottom of the V. Do another V. We'll do another half bead. So we're now starting to get vibration. And that's coming because we're, we're going down quite thin. Down to the bottom of our V. Now we can have fun. We can start thinking about the shape. So... On here, spindle gouge. And we're going to go nice and deep. Little OG. So let's come over with a convex into a concave. Don't worry, we are going back to the scoot. Just wanted to very quickly put that one in with the spindle. So now we'll go back to yes, Craig. Yeah, Terry's asked, um, have you ever used a lathe steady? And if so, did you make it? Um, I haven't used a lathe steady. I so I wouldn't have made it. Um, I think if I do need to use one, if I ever do need to use one, I would make it myself. The only reason I say that is because you can customize everything. 
a lot of the lathe studies that are available out there are fixed. They're a cast iron. Is a they're fairly small opening, um, but you can get some nice big soft wheels, um, skateboard wheels. I've seen used often, um, or skate wheels as well. So no, I haven't. Um, I would look to people like Richard Finley. Go on his website. I'm not sure whether he's got the actual demonstration of him using it, but I know he does fairly frequently. People like that, they're they're quite proficient at using the steadies. I don't really make that you know anything that that needs them. Staircase spindles, yes, but then I won't use the steady to do that. Um, so no, yes, great. Um, Peter said he seems to get a lot of tool vibration using the skew or carbide tools. Uh, what are the common causes for this, and uh, what should he be looking out for? Common causes are going to be size and dimension of the timber. The longer they are. Um, and the thinner they are, then you're going to get normal whip from from um, from a piece. So we were just talking about studies then. That would be where you would utilize a study. A study doesn't have to be all around. It can be literally just one um, or two wheels on the back just pushing to give you that extra hand. You saw me then just support the back of the, the timber with my hand. That would be what a, a you know, a, a, a just two-wheeled study would do as opposed to going all the way around. Um, but, yes, yeah, that it can be too much pressure on the bevel. You get it a lot of time, what we call bevel bounce on a bowl gouge on the uh, outside of a bowl where there's just too much. And that hard end grain is hitting and making the chisel literally bounce away into the softer areas. And then over um, the course of a few seconds, that will develop into uh, an actual um, a spiral going at the bowl. And it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, where the, the only way you can get over that then is to start again, change the speed, lift the handle a fraction to get more cutting action going. We're going to get it a little bit here in a minute. I'm just going to quickly finish this one off. Um, and we'll take our last few questions as time is going. So this is just a foot. This is round him over. So I'm just using the heel going all the way down, keeping the motion going. When I say motion, keeping the, the, the twist going. The minute you stop the twist, you get a flat. So right the way over. Into the bottom of the V. And then just turn the chisel over, get that long tip in. Just to make that, that, uh, that definition again that little ping let's go with um i'm gonna go with a bowl gouge now of all things let's go with a bowl gouge drop the tool rest drop the tool rest but just turn the lathe off while i do that because of that pummel just very quickly roughen that out I just chose to go with the tool rest there because that curve sort of lends itself perfectly to, sorry, bowl gouge, because the curve lends itself to a, um, a bowl gouge. It's nice and strong. There we are. Do the same thing here. bevel rubbing to the bottom of that curve then we'll use the spindle roughing gouge I can feel the vibration. Let's just stop the lathe, show you what we're getting from the roughing gouge. We know that it's a poor finish. It's not always going to be the best finish there. All right, so we're just going to go over with the skew for so tool rest high. And I'm just going to move our camera a little bit to get all of that view in. Hopefully that's, there we go. Now we can clean that finish up. So got the, the skew here. I'm going to start the cut off with no support. 
but fairly quickly. You can hear that vibration. Don't want that because that vibration will come across as a as a spiral. My hand comes around. I have to be careful what's happening back here. There's a square pummel going around. Uh, I'm not going to put my fingers anywhere near the tool rest. My thumb is on top of the skew just to support it, and my fingers are underneath the turning. Nothing near the tool rest whatsoever. Now, the question was being asked earlier about where, when do we shift away from the 45? And I said, when we get down to a little, um, when we get into a concave, that's when we come away from the 45, stand the chisel upright a little bit more, and you'll be able to get into nice, nice tight curves. So here we are, standing up a little bit further to get into a curve and to not hit the other side of that bit of detail. Okay, let's just tidy. We've got a little bit of our lip we need to get rid of. That's done. There we are. There's our leg. Let's get that up ready for camera one. There we are. One of four or six, depending on the type of table that you're going to make. It's going to be a very short table, so it'll be a coffee table type. But any more questions, Craig? Before we yeah, we've got a few questions um, ranked up here, there. my friends. So, uh, so the first one from Martin. Um, with the five-piece turning chisel set, oh, hang on, questions just bounced off my screen. Sorry, guys. So many questions coming in. Here we go. Right, with five-piece uh, turning set, any re recommendations? He's been using carbide, but he wants to tra transition into traditional. So recommendations on sets, really. Recommend I got, th well, yeah, three... Um, so, so I would go for, depending on what you want to spend, where you want to go, to the size of your lathe, because that does make a big difference. The size of your lathe, go for the, go for a, um, a boxed set because the handles are always going to be shorter. Um, and so if you're on a benchtop lathe, that means you've got far more move, uh, room to move. Um, if you've got a bigger machine, I would, instead of going for an actual box set, go for individual tools, but make up the set that way. Um, I'm a massive fan of any of the Crown um, stuff, either the M42 or the Axminster, um, the Axminster Premium range. Again, they're they're of a good length. The handles are a good length compared to the steel. You've got good flute geometry as well. Um, so any of those really. If you wanted a budget set, then go to the Axminster um, Craft range or the wood turning range. Um, you'll get the little beach handled ones there. They're they're nice. I think they're still under the hundred pound mark. Um, so yeah, any of those three really. M forty two, Axminster Premium, or the the budget Axminster uh, wood turning range. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Question from James. Um, what parts do you use to make your sanding platform? Sanding plat uh, sanding platform. Yes. Um, so we have. I haven't got the parts. In the top of my head but basically what we have is the um the, the tool post to suit your lathe so there's a, um, a selection there to select for your lathe so you'd have to know what your tool post width is um, and then it's the carving plate is the other piece and we're busy trying to find codes for you guys and then it's the stop collar okay so just three pieces um, and then you just a piece of mdf um uh, or decent flat material um Engineered material is better than just timber because timber moves. You know, engineered material like MDF, HDF, um, uh, plywood, those sorts of things be better. Uh, this has uh, got melamine on the surface, so it's nice and slidey as well for, for sanding on. All right. There we are. All right. Well, I think that's it for, for questions for a moment. Um, lots of love for the new um, GoPro camera angle. <laughs> They're liking that. Um, so good. <laughs> Good stuff. Okay. Well, um, if that last question doesn't get answered before we leave, if just email it into us, and I'll make sure I get all the relevant parts and, and bang to you. Um, but guys, thank you so much. Thanks for putting up for, with the start. We we don't know what went wrong. Um, just no sound, so we had to restart again. So um, thanks again for stopping by, everybody, and we'll catch up with you tomorrow. So thanks very much. Bye bye. <laughs>